to say that. When you go to chemistry school, you became more alert, you made a wake up, your spirit wake up, and you became a more human being. That's your character is built in a school. Classical studies. Uh, you may, we must know Medu nature. You see, maybe in the future we need to know some meritic too. We need to know Medu nature. For me, it's education. The way they think, they build, and they practice their education is very unique in history. Without education, I believe there will be no Kemet. Hotep, Hotep. Peace. Welcome to the Seshu channel. This is your brother Wujahu Menib Ma'at. And give a shout out to everyone who's tuned in. Hopefully you all who are tuned in, you know, you got here because you were notified, which means that you're a subscriber. Really, really appreciate that. Um, so don't want to take up too much time. Um, you know, I have to make up for yesterday. Yesterday, you know, if if you all been hanging out um for the past few live streams you all know that I'm I'm on a mission to really um stay true to our format that I've violated for for a few years <laughs> we had a st set format in place and um I just straight violated it all this time so you all may not even know about it so I shared it and basically the gist of it is that you know our video shouldn't go over 2 hours long and we break up the, that two hours into into um, key segments, and obviously it depends on the the type of show that we have. And so last night, um, so I've been doing good, you know. Got to give myself a pat on the back. I've been doing good, except for last night. Last night we had a, um, I forgot. I think it was four hours. I know it was four, no six. A six hour show. And so all the good that I did, all the good that I did on the previous live streams was wiped away with last night. So I got to start all over. So I don't want to take too much time. I want to um, kind of just jump straight into to some things. This is another um, video of uh, Kevin and Chill Open Discussions. And you all should know by now that this series of live streams, you all control the conversation so I deal with the um, the panel and by the way I need to put the panel link in the chat but you can either hop on the panel or you know type your questions or what you want to share inside the chat and you know we'll just give some comments about it um, so yeah but you know 
this reminds me of of a, a saying that was told to me when I was younger and it just sticks with me and the saying is that um, one screw up will erase 10 data boys all right and that is so true and all that means uh, again is one screw up will erase 10 data boys and what that means is that you could do 10 great things and that's where you, you know you get a pat on your back data boy data boy and you mess up one time that's the equivalent of of 10 good things so people will forget the 10 good things you did and focus on the one screw up that you did so it's a 10 to 1 ratio and that's what some you know elders told me well an elder told me when i was um younger you know and that's just stuck with me and so that's what happened i've been doing good y'all I, I, i've kept the the shows at two hours or under last night i did a six hour show and i'm gonna blame the brother uh smash rockwell for that yep that's right i'm blaming the magi archer because he's the one that came on and uh took the conversation and then he rolled out so he left he had to take care of family business and then he left me and you know i couldn't stop running my mouth me myself and uh emmy kept so all right but we want to stay true so anyway that's that's the story of what happened last night all right so um so check out the video it's long you know we're trying to keep it we're trying to keep it formatted so that you won't get bored and be discouraged from watching videos because i know if we're all honest you're not going to look at a video that's six hours long that takes too much of your time out of your day at least I, I'm not going to do it. And, and you know, I, I would not expect anybody to do it uh, for any video that I create that's that's very long. So two hours is good. And there's a reason why two hours is a good point. You know, that's why the Motion Picture um, Association creates movies, you know, around a two-hour-ish um, time frame because of the um, attention span of human beings and things like that. Well, we have a structure, so I'm going to stick to it. And if you're not familiar with the structure, let me just share with you all the structure. That's the structure right there. And I want to share this because um, what you all, you know, this is what you all can expect from, from us on this channel. And it will help you to look at the archives of our videos and then go, go to the certain timestamps to to get to the meat of of whatever we're dealing with or and whatnot or the commentary and and engagement of the chat etc all right because we've put a lot of um videos out there over the years in our archives and many of those videos touch on subjects that are coming up on a con on a constant basis like recycled topics and some people ask me do i get frustrated when the same topics keep coming up over and over again. Because people, you know, in the past, people kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? Kind of um, um, compliment me on my patience and tolerance. Like if I deal with people, people say, hey, you know, well, Joe, you got, you got patience of steel, you got tolerance and things. And I, I, and I tell people that say that, you know, I appreciate the, the comment um, if that's you know if that's how they view me as having tolerance and patience, but I tell them I tell them that do, in doing so you know I do get frustrated because I want to see progress I want to see people learn and I want to see um, progress being made and the only way that we can tell that we're making progress is by examining ourselves. That's why in school a teacher will give give out lessons give things to study and then the teacher will test give you an exam a quiz a test to see how proficient you are in in whatever it is that you all were supposed to study and based on that examination you know how proficient you are the teacher and the class the rest of the class knows how proficient you are and then based on that proficiency you're able to move forward and move on and it's a thermometer to let you know how well you retain and understood the information. 
And so that's a that's an educational environment. And that's what I'm all about. Education, teaching. I've been educating and teaching not as a profession. So I so I, I, I don't uh, work as a school teacher and that's not my profession making money as a school teacher as a formalized teacher but in every business and and a uh, job that I've had pretty much I've been a teacher or instructor you know either training and I've trained people who made you know much more money than me um I've had to train them in which I thought it was unfair but you know back in the day you know it, it was based on your age and you know kind of discriminated against based on age if you're young and these people are coming in with degrees they get a higher salary but yet here you are training them and 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 showing them their mistakes and things like that so i got i got a bone to pick with with my former employers you know from back in the day but anyway um but I've always been that way, and and you know, and then in school I've studied um, pedagogical, andragogical methods of teaching and things like that. So I understand the importance of setting up a healthy learning environment in order to one learn, two gauge the learning process, and three have the ability to move forward and to grow. And that's what it's all about: growth, growth in knowledge. And once you grow your body of knowledge, then the next major s step is to turn that into art or application. When you apply the knowledge, you you know you apply what what you can. You make a utility out of it, application, execution, and all of that good stuff. All right, and that's what I want to see. And so, um, so you know, it does frustrate me when I see these topics come up over and over again. And to me, it's entertainment. It's just play. It's like a, um, a recess playground. And I'm all for having fun. I'm all for joking. I'm all for um, playing and, and entertainment. But we should never play, laugh, joke, and be all about entertainment at the expense of our growth. That's the difference. So, yes, we can have fun. Yes, we could, you know, shake a leg. Yes, we could, you know, loosen up a bit, you know. Um, and have some fun, have some chuckles, have some laughs and things like that. But we should never do that at the expense of our progress and our growth. And that's my stance and I'm, you know, I stand strong on that point. And so that's why, you know, um, I express myself this way, you know, that you all may hear um, when these different topics and things come up. So anyway, that's pretty much... Um, where we are so on the channel you know check out the archives we have a lot of information that we've covered um, with the intention of it being a resource for people if you want to know and so what we have to do is we have to do a better job maybe at um, retitling some of the older videos and then placing timestamps in the description so that you can kind of hop through the video based on whatever it is that you're looking for so now that's going to be a process for for us to go back and do that and uh so that's going to take time but that's what we're going to be doing to help everybody out all right now in speaking of all of that and in lieu of last night uh one thing i said last night is that i realized it's kind of like it just came it just uh knocked me over the head again that on these youtube streets all the all the conversations dealing with ancient Egypt and things um, there's no, hardly any videos or people actually breaking down the mechanics of the language on YouTube now I don't expect people to do it on YouTube because it's not a very um, conductive or environment it's not a very conducive environment to really get down to the nitty gritty of the language but I think because it's not mentioned enough that people take it for granted. So people feel that they can learn all about Egypt and argue, fuss and fight about ancient Egypt without even going through the basics of the language. And we know that's not true. We know that the only way that you can become intimate with a culture that's not your own 
is by way of the language of that culture. Why? Because language is the DNA of culture. It is the medium in which a culture permeates itself and communicates itself to its members. And so it records the psyche, the psyche of the people. It's within the language, the words, the forms, the concepts that are linked to the forms, the meanings, the, the literary devices within the language the realities behind those literary devices and those figurative expressions, all of that stuff. And then all of those things are mapped to a writing system for those uh, population groups that had writing systems. Many populations um, didn't have them until very recent. Writing systems, that is. So all of that is the doorway or the window um, in order to you know get become intimate with the culture and so we have to always remind ourselves of that and I've been teaching the language for over 10 years now and what inspired me or motivates me to to stick with it and and stay strong with that is because of the fact that language is the DNA of culture and anybody's gonna talk Egypt Egypt talk they better know the basics of the language if they don't, they're handicapped. Now, that's not me making that up, and that's not me hating on anybody, even though I'm not mentioning any, any names of any particular people, but that's just a fact. And it's not just with ancient Egypt. It's with any culture. If, if you wanted to learn about Islam and Muslims, you better learn Arabic at least on the fundamental basic level. Now, you don't have to get a, um, a degree in Arabic or any of these cultural uh, languages related to different cultures, but you've got to learn the basics because these cultures are documented in their respective language. To understand the Quran, to understand the mindset of a Muslim, the mindset of anyone who adheres to these things, you have to become familiar with the language all right and this goes for anything if you if you want to know about the mindset of jews you better learn hebrew or hebrew israelites you better learn hebrew um etc etc if, if you if you you know if you want to stay on the continent of africa if you want to learn about yoruba culture and Isheshe, a lot of people convert over to Isheshe, Ifa um, practices and things like that. You better learn Yoruba, the language. You know, how you sound, you know, reading the, the Odus and, and things like that, but you can't read or speak or... And what's fortunate about the languages that I'm mentioning now, you know, as far as Arabic, Hebrew, Yoruba, and etc., these are living languages. You can actually walk up to people and talk and 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 communicate and learn from and hear how the these things sound and so on and so forth so you better you better take advantage of that unlike ancient egypt or ancient egyptian um the language is considered dead it's not extinct but it's dead there's a difference because ancient egyptian language is actually still exists so it's not extinct, but it's dead. It's not a language that is um, a mother tongue of, um, of a speech population. It's usually a litur liturgical language spoken um, or dealt with by the cops over in the Arab Republic of Egypt right now to this day. All right. It's it's the most recent iteration. All right. So anyway, I think I'm going on a little little long-winded there so let's just get into some um questions and answers we could kind of you know last night we went six hours and there were people that were asking questions that i that i didn't get to and i went back to the video and kind of scanned through the chat and i was like wow you know was, there was quite a few questions but but at the same time <laughs> people are having conversations in the chat you know the chat have a mind of its own, of its own people are talking to each other so I have to kind of fish through through the um, conversations and whatnot. But um, 
I just want you all to understand those those points I was just bringing up. And lastly, let me just um, share my screen. I want to share something with you all. Um, and I brought this up last night. So I'm going to kind of add to it. This is what I want you all to do. Now, mind you, remember, remember what I said. YouTube is not a not the best educational platform. Now, it's a it's a social media platform where you can share videos, share anything you want. You can share information, but it's not a a it's not a good educational platform because um, when you're dealing with education, there has to be engagement. Because, like, for example, if I do a presentation, I can do a presentation, record it, and then upload it on YouTube. So, bam, my job is done, right? No. I need to know from those who are watching my video, I need to know if you understand what I said. And you all, you need to know if you understood what was presented in the video. And the intention of the video and so on and so forth so there has to be a two-way street engagement so YouTube doesn't allow that um, it's not the best platform for that so education is best done or learning and education is best done in a learning environment and so this is what we're doing and what we've been doing but now we're going to turn it up times 10 is that we're where we are forming a community of students People who want to learn and engage within a learning environment. All right. And so what I shared last night is a website. Um, Sable University. So I want all of you all who are watching to join this website. It's free to join and it's going to grow. The website has been around for, for quite a minute, but it was um, we only used it for the beginner's introduction to uh, Session Meta Nature. And that was, you know, done so that everyone will have one place to go to sign up, register, and, and you know, get notifications and whatnot. But we've s since expanded it. It's called Sabah University or Sabah. You know, the word Sabah is an ancient Egyptian word, which means um, either student, teacher, instructions, um, learning, pupil, disciple, discipline. All these words have uh, similar meanings under this word sabah. Yes, sub different forms of sabah. Sabait, sabat, sabah, etc. All right. So it's the learning university. It's the univer The you know the um, the container for the learning environment. All right. And so on here. What you could do, I'm just going to show you all very quickly. On here, there is a um, function on the website that's very similar to Facebook where we can have groups. And so this is a community. And so just as, just as Facebook has a main feed, like when you log into your Facebook account, you see the, your, your main um, activity feed or timeline as we call it, you know, your timeline. Well, you have your personal timeline. Um, then you have a timeline that everybody who's your friend and, and that can see. But then Facebook also has groups, Facebook groups. So on Sable University, we also have groups, but we only created one. And this one group that's created is called Nile Valley and Delta Cultural Studies. That's the name of the group. Just created it today. And um, for anybody who wants to, you know, get into more of a learning environment where we can, you know, exchange information, answer questions, share information, give commentary, give corrections, self-correct, and all these other kind of things. All right. It has the same kind of functionality as Facebook groups. So if you, if you are a Facebook user, this will, will be a piece of cake. All right. So I'm asking every one of you to register to the site is free all right also on the site are courses not so much um, big courses they're they're quick lessons or quick um, uh, quick lessons 
or um, courses. Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah, we call them quick lessons. So they're either lessons or presentations. But the but the difference here is instead of just me lecturing, y'all just listening to me being all boring and everything, um, and then that's it. No, you you are given information, whether it's uh, uh, you read it or you listen to it on a video, watch it on the video, but then you're given a quiz based on the content of the information, and you're graded. And so this is a learning environment. This is this is that two-way street I was talking about where you can um, see if you understood and, and retained the information and haven't um, comprehended it and, you know, and whatnot. Um, and then also, you know, those of us who put these quizzes or, or lessons together, we get to know, you know, how everyone is doing. And most of these are free. All right. So I don't want to hear any excuse from people like, oh, no, nah, you know. I'm um, not, you know, can't afford it, whatever the case is. A lot of these quick lessons are built off of discussions we have on YouTube and whatnot. And most of them are free. There's only three um, items on here that are uh, that cost anything. Like, for example, this has the Egyptian hybrid for writing system been deciphered, a rebuttal to Walter Williams. And we can put that together based on the content of the book. So this is based on the book. Let me click on it so y'all see it. So the book cover looks like this as well. Um, I don't have a picture of the book on, on here, but this the book cover looks like this. The book is available on Amazon, or you can um, register here, and you'll be paying for the book. So the cost of this is, is the cost of the book, and you have to have it to follow along and get quizzed and so on and so forth. But believe me, when you get the book and read the book and you take these quizzes and you do you do well, you pass, then that information is going to be under your belt. You can move on. Now you understand what a writing system is, how the decipherment took place, um, all the things that people said, and how the hieroglyphic writing system was not deciphered. You'll know how the, the glyphs function, what are the glyphs, what are different ways they could function within a word, um, and all that good stuff. All right, so that's what you will learn. And you and you keep it moving, so um, so that's really not that's really a free course. You're just paying for the book. Um, the only other one that costs um, money is the beginner's introduction to Egyptian hieroglyphic. That's the beginner's course that I've been doing for over ten years. I've changed it to like a self pace. It's only one hundred thirty dollars. The thirty dollars is is for the textbook, the beginner's introduction um, book. But if you already have it, because it's available on Amazon also, if you already have that, then the, then the course is only $100. The cheapest out there. And um, it used to be 12 weeks. It's the equivalent of 12 weeks worth of information, but you go at your own pace. And um, you have access to two hours once a week where you get live Q&A and all the discussions about the content of the book and everything like that. All right. Um, there was a third one, yeah. Logical reasoning. This is important. Let me click on this one. This is important because the so-called conscious community is lacking in um, logical reasoning. And I know it sounds like a put down when I'm saying it like this, but if anybody observes, well, first of all, you have to kind of be into logic or or have some kind of background in logic, formal logic, informal logic, argumentation, theory, one of, um, argument, debating, all of that uses logic. And we take it for granted. So it's not something that, you know, people um, are incapable of doing. It's just that these are things that we take for granted. We don't even know that, that this is what we're dealing with. Logical fallacies, people don't know what the logical fallacies are and they, and they violate them left and right left and right left and right not even on it so a quick course like this is good for people to learn what is logic what is logical reasoning what are the logical fallacies how to avoid them how to identify them how to respond to them and so on and so forth so this one is um, $9.99 $10 all right and also on this on the website we're gonna open it up to anybody if, if you um, can put together a, a lesson or a course and you want to charge for it or 
allow it to be free, whatever, we're open to it because it's not just about ancient Egypt, okay? Uh, it looks that way right now because um, myself and Emicat are the only ones that's putting content on on the site at the moment. But anything that we feel that we all need to know and can benefit from, it should be on this site. Anything that, 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 that needs to be um, communicated in a learning environment, you know, it's not going to replace, obviously not going to replace YouTube or the function of YouTube. Everybody could share anything. But when you need that learning environment, that two-way street where people can engage and you can tell if people understand what's being presented and they can, um, you know, gauge themselves and test themselves, um, then th th this is what this is for. All right. So y'all go ahead and register to the site. All right. So that is that. And I had a long opening and let me mute myself and allow somebody else to speak for a change, right? I know y'all like, man, would y'all you talk too much? My name is Imiket and yeah, I don't have much really to say other than uh, just to emphasize what has been said. Um, you know, we, we definitely want to keep everything structured and we, you know, the goal is really to, um, you know, we want to make sure that even when we're on YouTube, um, this is one place where we have to be very aware of, you know, the audience that, that we, we, we come on live to present um, the information to. So obviously, you know, we can have those discussions by ourselves, you know, uh, behind closed closed doors or whatever, like we do sometimes on the weekends. You know, we have, um, you know, uh, private groups where we, you know, have those information. But once you hit live, obviously, you want to have some kind of interaction and you want to share stuff with people. So that's why we want to make sure that we structure everything and that uh, people can come out of, um, you know, the live sessions on YouTube with something. So we definitely make sure that we keep in mind that it has to be a short time, like Ujao said, uh, you know, there's only so much uh, that the brain can take at a certain point before it starts to shut down. Um, and that's just obvious. So we make sure that the information has to be within a set period. And we also encourage people to, you know, definitely come on a panel. So uh, hit that panel link and, and you know, so that we can have, you know, a, a more healthy discussion. And I'd like to say that uh, in regards with Sabre University, um, one of the things that is definitely beneficial uh, when putting up a course, it, it kind of helps you, um, you know, learning, making, uh, creating curriculums is actually something that I would encourage, encourage uh, uh, people to do because it, it helps you understand how information is digested. And even if you yourself as, a, as, as, as somebody who's uh, teaching has digested the information properly. And that's why we, you know, like we just suggested in the beginning, we do presentations because that's when you kind of uh, go back and, and, you know, do, do your checks and balances and figure out, did I really understand this? Because the only best way to, to 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 know if you understood something is how well you can explain it to other people. So other than just the presentations, we encourage people to actually you know put the courses together and bring them over at Seba University. And I would say you know whether you're charging them or not, and the the whole platform is built to make sure that you know you can um, definitely check you know how your students are interacting, uh, how you're paid, and all, all that kind of stuff. So that is a benefit. So I would encourage other people whatever it is um that you're good at that you want to share with people um that you try to put a course together and, and put it on Sabre university i know i would like to actually get get to enroll in other people's courses as well and learn different things so yeah just that really i don't have much to say other than that well you said a mouthful though um all right so let's jump into it y'all this is kevin and chill um again shout out to everyone who's tuned in Really appreciate anyone who's tuned in because we, you know, we go live. We just pull up on you out the blue. I think you all are used to that now. So, you know, that's good. But um, open Q&A, open discussion, open sharing, criticism. We, we welcome everything. All right. The only thing we don't welcome is the drama, shenanigans, and all the buffoonery and tomfoolery and all the other ooleries that you can think of. We don't, we don't welcome that. You will definitely be uh, shown the door. All right. No tolerance. People say, I, you know, I have patience of steel and I've toler I tolerate a lot of things. That's that's true. You know, I, I just I think so as well. 
but I'm telling you, anybody that's been around me or whatever, they know they know that certain things that will um, frustrate me. And that's definitely one. People with bad character, all that kind of stuff. No, nah, that's just not happening. You know, miss me with that. All right. But we haven't had a problem over here with, with any of that. So, you know, I'm not trying to bring any of that, um, as, as people say, bring that energy or whatever the case is. So let's just keep it. But let's just jump in. So I'm checking out the chat. Shout out to Donnie Williams. Shout out to um, Lil King, L.A. Oklahoma. That's our brother Damo, brother Zane. Oh, by the way, Zane, appreciate the cash app. Um, I didn't even see it when you did it at first yesterday. I saw it today. So appreciate the cash app. And that's another thing, you all, you know, we don't ask for donations. We don't we don't have um, a donation, you know, a ticker, you know, going across the bottom or anything that, that we see on other channels and whatnot. And that's not to say that that um, that's bad by any means. So because people will take my words and try to twist them up. No, I'm saying that we haven't done that and we don't do that. We don't we don't do that. And I, I forget that we even have super chat uh, capabilities on this channel. So I'm only saying that because we don't solicit donations, um, but people tell us that we should. And um, yeah, so I appreciate any donations, especially when we don't even solicit it. So I uh, appreciate that, uh, Brother Zane, for um, donating. Now, I'm gonna tell you, any donations we get, any free will offerings or whatever the case is, they definitely go straight to books. Oh, and that's another thing I forgot to mention. Um, like I said, we, we want to form a community of, um, of students, you know. Um, and I'm not saying a community of my students or I'm the teacher, you know. I'm not trying to be a master teacher. We, we have our share of master teachers out there. They, and they are pseudo as all outdoors. <laughs> y'all know that I'm telling the truth. I bet you, if y'all, depending on your age, you're probably like, that's no cap or facts, facts. <laughs> so what I'm saying, though, is I'm trying to be a part of a community of people who don't mind engaging information in a learning environment because YouTube is not, is, not, is not that. YouTube has its purpose. You know, it's great. YouTube is allowing us to do what we're doing right now. You know, YouTube allows you all to hear me and all that kind of stuff. So YouTube has its, has its um, use, but it's not a learning environment like I, like I mentioned earlier. So in this community, though, like me, I look at it like we're all learning. And I have my strengths and I have my weaknesses. And everybody does. But if you have good character and, you have, and you're have and you honest with yourself, you can own up to your strengths and you can own up to your weaknesses and be honest about it. And then you can lean on people like wherever you're weak at, you can lean on someone who is strong in that area. And so that's how I see it as a community of people who are trying to learn together. Like we're all learning. Now me, I've been studying Egypt, ancient Egypt, Egyptian culture for quite a while. I've been teaching the language for over 10 years, but I've been studying about all this stuff a lot longer. And so I have tenure in there. I got skin in it. Um, I'm familiar with arguments, the scholars. I keep up with the latest and greatest information. I do my best to do that. And the old stuff, all the way from the beginning of Egyptology, 19, I mean, 19, 1832, the decipherment, why they even started to try to decipher, all that kind of stuff. So that's been my focus. And so if anybody wants to know about it, hey, you can come and 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 pick my brain and I'll just do my best. And then vice versa, um, I'll do that to somebody else in, a, in a, an area that I don't focus on. And so within a community, um, I'm, what I'm getting at is that we need to share resources. So as part of the community on Sable University, if you join the group, the, we only got one group right now as far as a, a, a focus group on the on the website. Um, I will share books that I have. And I have tons of books, y'all. If I showed you, I got I got goo gobs of gigs. I got gig, gigabytes of gigabytes <laughs> 
of um of PDFs, of resources, of books and things like that that I've collected. I have a lot. Things that I even forget I have. People pull up screenshots of books and I'm like, wait a minute, that looks familiar. And then come find out, search my hard drive. I'm like, oh man, I had this book. And I'll look at the date that I've had it since. It'd be like uh, September 14th, 2011. I'm like, boy, I had this book all this time. You know, whatever the case is. So however I got the books, I'm, I'm willing to share. So I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that when people donate, like if you donate, I, that money goes into books, more resources and stuff like that. It's a war chest for me. That's how I see it, you know. Um, and so, like I said, we don't solicit donations, but, hey, people that donate and want to feel that way um, to donate, I'll definitely not turn it, turn it back. And that's what it goes to. So I'm just being transparent let you all know that donations go towards books. And I'll share them because I'll try to get the um, – get these books and get it digitized or the digitized versions and then we share now one thing that I don't do is um, there are certain scholars and things that I don't um, like I would tell people to buy the book like I'm not going to digitize like for example I'll just give you an example uh, Jean-Claude and Boley's 2010 um, African language book although it's in French and people who can't you know don't deal with French they're not gonna get it anyway but we were talking about that book for 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 a good while Asar Motep brought basically introduced it to the whole community and everything um it, even if that book was in English and I had a digital copy of it I wouldn't give books like that out because I would tell people to support and buy the book and then we can you know have a book club and we could or whatever we could talk about it and whatnot so, so there, are, there are limits to to what I will um, share. It depends, but those books that are out of copyright, like all of Budge's books, Breasted books, all the early Egyptological books and stuff like that, and there are a lot, y'all. There are a lot. If I got it, you got it. Simple as that. And I got a lot of stuff. All this Nubian talk, man. I have stuff on Nubia for days. You know, and that's another thing. A lot of stuff that we talk about. It's regurgitated information, stuff that we could find on Wikipedia, um, in books and stuff like that. We're, we're really not advancing the field like we, we may think we are. We're really not. We're behind. And that's what frustrates me, too, because people playing games with, with all these conversations. I'm like, man, when are we going to really put some, put some meat behind this stuff and grow the, 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 um, the discipline? No matter what it is, it could be ancient Egypt, it could be science, it could be biogenetics or whatever. All we're doing, all we're doing really, if we're honest, is we're just parrots, parakeets and parrots regurgitating what the they are doing. Now there's a few sprinkles of people that are knee deep in and, and getting their hands dirty and whatnot, but not enough. Not enough. Not to my satisfaction. Y'all, you know, y'all may be satisfied, but I'm not satisfied. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to dive in head first and let's push this thing forward. All right. So anyway, all right, enough of that, man. I'm 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 ready for some conversations, some questions, some some sharing, somebody jumping on a panel or whatever. Um so y'all go ahead and shoot it. Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. And you know it would help if you if you had a question. It would help if you um, if you at the sesshu, so that your question would be highlighted. So you know um, I will see it quicker. All right. So because you 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 all know you right. You all will have a conversation in the chat that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Nothing to do with what I'm talking about. And I got to look through the conversation. It's like, hey, hey, John boy, how's the wife and kids? Oh, they fine, man. You know, we took them to the movies, boy. We went to go see Batman. And uh, what's that new movie that came out? Um, what's the movie that came out? I forgot the movie came out. Yeah, y'all y'all have y'all own conversations. I'm like, man, if y'all were in school, y'all would definitely get get in trouble. 
All right, so let's jump in. I think Sadiq A got the first question, right? And MBK, you got to help me out here. Um, yeah, that, that was the first question. All right, so Sadiq A, peace to, to the brother Sadiq. Um, did y'all reset all of the accounts on Sabre University? My account is not recognized. Sorry if this was answered. Oh, um, that's a good question. I'll, I'll check for you. Uh, inbox me. Inbox me, and, and I'll check for you. I'll make sure. All right? So he's trying to take care of business first. Um, but that was it. I'm at the, I'm at the bottom already. Seshu, can you invite Ralph Illis on your show and challenge him on his video where the ancient Egyptians black? Wait, who is Ralph Illis? Let me look up Ralph, Ralph Illis. Let's let's look up Ralph. Let's look up uh let's look we, up what talking about. Well, you know, whether you're looking it up, we're definitely not going to invite anybody <laughs> on this show to discuss what the ancient Egyptians were black because as we usually say, you know, that's a slow bus. Um topic really so definitely not you know i would just say so like that that conversation is just not worth it i am looking you said this video do this for me um mark white if you can and i'm not sure if you can post links in the chat i think you you have to have a wrench to do that but try it try post a link to the video you're talking about where the ancient egyptians black but like Emmy Kett said, I will say this about that topic. That is a short but shorty topic. Um, the Egyptians being black or white, it's it it works against us to have that conversation. And I've explained why. You know, I explained why multiple times. But if if you're if you're here for the first time, um, the conversation is a um, retro quicksand black hole rabbit hole conversation because here's the thing and this is what I tell everyone that try to bring up race and genetics in conversation like that right now race the social construct of race is a very real uh, perceived phenomenon that we deal with today okay that's number one two um, or s having said that uh race is real all, all you know although it's a social construct um but our modern social construct of race does not apply to any people of antiquity the reason being is because people are not defined by race people were defined by other criteria outside of race our modern social construct because it's a modern one. So if I'm saying modern versus antiquity, then it's like, duh, of course our modern social constructs would not have existed in antiquity. That's one. Two, when people try to bring up DNA in these conversations about ancient Egyptians and et cetera, et cetera, um, DNA as important of a field of science that it is, you know, genetics and biology, period, those are very important um, fields of study. It does. That's the wrong tool to use in these conversations. It's like trying to use a screw gun to perform heart surgery. No one in their right mind would do that. So everyone who tries to bring up DNA in these conversations, they're not in their right mind, but they just may not know it. But the reason why is because a group of people are never defined by their genetics. The human genome, in fact, was not even mapped until 2003. And it was partially mapped at that. It wasn't completely mapped until very recently, save one chromosome. So there's no way that populations could be defined based on their genome sequence. And it never was in all of human history. Even to this day, every group of people that you can name, the name that you give to that group of people, whether it's an exonym or endonym, meaning either they were named themselves a name or they were given a name from, that, from other people other than themselves, whatever that name is, and that definition of by distinguishing them as a group, it was not on the basis of genetics. 
period. Okay, and so that's why I say the race conversation and the genetic conversation in the context of ancient Egyptians and all that other kind of stuff that we talk about is misplaced. And I don't involve myself in it other than to tell people not to do it like I'm doing now. People got to stop doing that. If you're going to talk about ancient Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians were the ancient Egyptians not because of their genetics. They were the ancient Egyptians because of their cultural elements that made up who and what they are. It's a, it's a cross between the level of ethnicity and the level of culture. That's what defines people. That's what informs us of who and what people are. Because you don't, you don't know about a person. A person, and here's the thing, a person can have a genetic profile matching yours or very, very close to yours, but be a completely different person. They were molded, shaped, influenced, psychologically different, culturally different, different ideals, different worldviews, different, different, different values. Their taboos could be your, your, um, okay with you and vice versa and whatnot so it doesn't inform you about the person dna informs us about dna dna informs us about relationships and those relationships are biological so with dna you can show the proximity of relationships who is related to who on a biological level and that and that's very helpful you know in in where 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 it it applies it just don't apply in these situations so i hope y'all i hope y'all who are hearing what i'm saying now understand that because i think i i repeat that so much and people wonder why i don't get into those conversations i've put a link of um the playlist for the videos where you've touched on all that and 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 it's on the chat so if you see that link, um, that has a whole playlist of, um, you know, all that, uh, or the Egyptians black and all that, who cares, that type of stuff. So, yeah, if that interests you, definitely get that, you know, hit that link. Yep, yep. So that's it. But but me personally, you know, I, I like biogenetics. I like um, I like that. I like genetics. I like I like DNA. I like uh, genealogy. Um the combination, you know, genealogy, family trees, and and DNA, and things like that. Um, fascinated with that stuff, but I I know enough to know that you're not going to use a screw gun to perform open heart surgery. You just don't do that. So I'm not going to mis misapply DNA. You just shouldn't do that. Um. Okay. Uh, Obi Wan Kenobi says, um, "Is it true the term hikakasut?" was first used to refer to people south of Kemet before it was used for the Asiatic Hyksos. That is absolutely true. Hikakasut, the word kasut, let's start with the word kasut. The word kasut is the feminine plural of the word chaset, which means hill. It's a hill. And the word um you know, started to the semantic shifting of that word from meaning hill to foreigner is due to the natural progression of the fact that ancient Egypt had a natural border of hills on its east and west um, flanks or borders or um, sides, the east and west side, east being Iabet and west being Amenet. And so um, that was a natural border were these hills in the desert, the desert and the hills. And so any group of people coming from beyond the hill was not an Egyptian by default. And so that became foreigners. And so the hills was the demarcation line between the Egyptians and their foreign neighbors. So therefore the word for hill became the word for foreigner. And so chaset pluralized as chasut or some people say chaswet. 
um, is the word for foreigners. And Heka is the word for ruler. So Heka Kasut are the rulers or the ruler or the elite or dignitaries uh, from foreign territories. But that's correct. It was first applied to people of the South. All right, so yes, that's true. And and so what this means, the takeaway here, to add to that, is that Hyksos is not a, an ethnic group. So remember that. Hyksos is not an ethnic group, and it's not a race. Hyksos is simply the word foreigners. And I actually just saw a text, and if I can remember where I just saw it, I saw it today, as a matter of fact. If I can remember where I just saw that, as it refers to um, the people in Ta-Nehisi, I'll pull it up. But I actually saw a text today. And I was looking up something else. And it's crazy because when you look up one thing, um, you find things that you're not looking for. And then when you're looking for that thing, you, you know, it, it, you're like, oh, man, where did I see that? You know, I wasn't even looking for that. But I saw it uh, just today, earlier today. All right. So... Um, all right, so that's that. Now, remember, the word Asiatic is, rever if we reverse engineer Asiatic, that's what people translate the word Amu, the Egyptian word Amu, and they call them Asiatic. And we know Asia is Orient, and Orient is East. And so the Easterners um, were called Amu, but that word more so deals with um, their their tendency to be nomadic and wandering about non sedentary people, people who don't have a, a real home, sedentary home, like how the Egyptians saw themselves. You know, and mind you, the ancient Egyptians or the Remich, we're gonna start calling them by their by their names, y'all. So the Remich, they thought that they were all that in a bag of chips. All right, so let's not get it twisted. The, the ancient Egyptians or the Remich, they thought that they were the best of the best. But who wouldn't and who didn't? Every ethnic group thinks highly of themselves. All right, so I just want to remind y'all that the ancient Egyptians, they thought that Egypt was the center of the world. That creation happened right in Egypt. The, the the first emergence of land that's that's uh sim symbolized by the um pyramidal or that primordial rock stone pyramid or hill that raised out of the oceans of noon is all all that all that stuff that you hear and read about that took place in Egypt and and the Egyptians themselves they come from the tears of Ra so Ra cried, and then poof, the Egyptians came out of his eyes. <laughs> so Egyptians thought, you know, they thought that they were all that, but everybody does. You know, I'm, I'm saying it jokingly, but everybody does. So that's not, that's not nothing, that's not anything new, you know. And I, the reason why I say that is because the, um, their neighbors were seen as um, subordinate in that sense the southern neighbors the eastern neighbors the western neighbors they didn't even have northern consider any northern neighbors until the, the Aegean later at a later time time periods the Aegean or Aegean uh, islands and whatnot and all that kind of stuff that's why they only have four four um, population groups themselves and three others it was the Remich the Amu the Nehisiu, and then the Ch Chimehu. And those represent the, the cardinal points. They themselves are the center. They're the Khanu, or the interior. And then to their east was the Amu, to their south was the Nehisiu, and to their west was the Chimehu. Put another way, the Asiatics, the quote-unquote Nubians, which is a word I don't like to use, and then you have the Libyans. That's it. And on top of that, just to add to it, I know you didn't ask, but on top of that, the Egyptians saw themselves as one of 10 groups of people, collectively. 
So the Egyptians are the Remich, and then you have nine others. And those nine others became the Pesedjit or Pesedju, known, aka known as the nine bows. And those nine bows, it was ten altogether. Um, but if you subtract the Egyptians themselves out of that, it leaves nine. And so you have these nine bows, and this common theme of the nine bows representing the enemies of the state. But by enemy of the state, they still dealt with them, traded with them, married the women, and all, you know all of that good stuff. But by enemy of the state, what they meant was that they represented chaos, or the chaotic tendencies were were um, happening in those territories and not in Egypt. Now, how do you know? How you know this with y'all, or that particular specifics of the of the concept? Because the ancient Egyptians. They had a list of nine bows, right? But at different times, the list, the names on that list would alter and change depending on what time period you look, you're dealing with. And believe it or not, the ancient Egyptians put themselves on a list sometimes, but not as Egypt in its totality, but in certain portions of Egypt. So you have Ta Mehu on the list sometimes. Ta uh, Shemau on the list sometimes. Upper Egypt was definitely on the list at times. Okay, so anyway, just just want to keep it. Um, Got to be real with all this stuff, y'all. Uh, what else? And you know, I'm kind of going slow with these questions because you all you all are kind of um, uh, surprisingly not chatting too much this time I don't think have you listened to all all the tribes of Africa including the climate animals dietary and other small tribes other surrounding tribes huh oh have you listed all the tribes of Africa including the climate animals dietary and other small tribes other surrounding tribes Okay, maybe you could, if you could reword that for me, I would appreciate it because I'm not quite understanding what you're saying or, or asking, um, Brother Joseph. But if you're, if you're asking me, have I listed all the, all the tribes of Africa, I'm going to tell you that straight out, no. No. There are a whole lot of tribes. In Kenya alone, there's 42 tribes. In Kenya alone, I do know that. All right. Um, and we got to understand what tribe is tribe, you know, tribe people, you know, I hear people say, you know, they don't like to use the word tribe because tribe is a is a European concept. It's a that's a European thing. And if you trace out the etymology of that word tribe, um, I'm like. What word would you replace with it? And they say ethnicity. I'm like, well, do you do know that et ethnicity is also a European word? too? <laughs> I'm like, man, you can't. I'm like, why you? That can't be your reason of not to use the word tribe, you know, but the the more the more logical reason of of trying to stay away from the word tribe is because of what it came to mean. Tribe came to connote um, savagery, wildness, uncultured, you know, uncivilized. And so that's what the word, you know, became came to be um, came to mean. And so I get that. But people can't be running that um, because it's a European word and whatnot. I don't run that on me. But um, but anyway, so people use ethnic groups. Ethnology is definitely the move. All right. Um, I'm trying to keep going down. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I'm keep on. I'm keep going down. Philatus. The Seshu okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate if you're if you are um at the Seshu, that way it stands out. Uh, what was the purpose of the temple of million the temple of millions of years? Did the ancient Remich have a true concept of passing of a million years time? No. Just like we don't. We 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 say these numbers but we don't we don't we can't really conceive a million years. Like you really can't if you think about it. We can say it. We can put any any number of zeros behind a number, and we can say you know, gazillion, 
Like you know how when you're young you say Kazillion Billions and billions and billions and gazillions You know zillions We just go to the end of the alphabet Zillions It just means a lot And so the ancient Egyptians they had a concept of Of eternity And Um There was two Similar concepts about When it comes to time There was um Eternity And then something that lasts forever And one is more cyclic And one is more linea linear Linear passage of time And one is more cyclic Where it, it repeats But it repeats forever Okay so that was like two different things And then the ancient Egyptians Had a concept of the plurality of the plural Which they, which they conceive as the number nine And so that also meant a lot like that's that's the way of saying a lot so in in the language they had um singular plural and dual whereas in english we don't have those we just have plural singular and plural but they have singular plural and dual and the plural of plural was the three by three so it's to take three and then pluralize three which is another three and you multiply that which makes nine and so they will call the deities in different groups the Pesedju which means the company of nine all right and you'll see that you'll see it drawn in the old kingdom with nine um um I want to call them people think that the glyph is a, a flag but these are standards. You'll see nine standards. Like if you look at if you look at the pyramid text, the actual glyphs themselves, the primary sources, you'll see that a lot in the pyramid text in, in, in the old kingdom. Then you'll you'll start to see one um, standard drawn with the the triple stroke uh, determinative representing plural. All right. Um, So let's see. I'm going to keep on going. The brother Tony. The same way you say Nubia is a misnomer and it's different people that are Nubians, can't we apply the same thing to the Remage, knowing they are more than one tribe collectively? Um, no. See, here's the, here's the difference. Um, an ethnic group is organically grown just like a culture is organically grown there is no culture where you're going to find a group of people called a meeting and sat at a round table and said hey we're going to create this culture a culture has its genesis in a natural organic formation then the next step of a culture is to become self-aware of itself and all that that's nothing spooky all that means is that a group of people that share the elements that make up a culture they they start to realize that they're sharing these elements and these shared elements becomes conscious within the minds of those same people and then they realize that they have in fact a culture and the same thing with um, ethnicity but ethnicity is a little more narrow than, than a culture on a more narrow level than a culture and so I say that because the ancient Egyptians um, nationally collectively you know as a whole they were the remage now they did have a social hierarchy they have the um, eripat which are the elite, you have the remage collectively as a whole, and then you also have the rakit, which are the commoners, or people who are subjects to the king, and, and other um, people. Then you have the um, administrative structure, the hierarchy, from the king to the vizier or visors, to the, um, to the hati'ah, to the emiraz, 
to the uh, hem hem x and x means what the the priest of whatever or hemet of whatever and so on and so forth you had the treasurers you had the uh, people who were responsible for the um, different institutions and agencies in Kemet so it, it's it's different now what makes it different is that Nubia there is no such place as Nubia it's a region that scholars have given to to a, a, a certain area on the map within that area you have different people who have realized their distinct their distinctions so the Wawet people or Wawatiyu people are not the Kau you people unlike the Remish they saw themselves collectively as a unit as a unit all right and so we have to remember that that's the that's the difference uh, or we could take Kosh which we say is Kush the Kushi or Kushiyu or we say Kushites they distinguish themselves from the Remish and even from the other um, people in their neighbors, they had neighbors. Now, collectively, so we have we have levels of of identity or population demarcations. So all of them would be Nahisiu, meaning the ancient Egyptians had a region. They envisioned or conceptualized a region in their day and time. Everything south of ancient Egypt was was considered Nahisiu the interior of Africa that is not their interior they were the interior the actual name of Egypt prior to being called Kemet one of them outside of the word Tawi is the word Khenu which means the interior so they the, the, the interior part and they were the middle but everything south of that was um, was Nahisi and later, the word Nahisi became um, came to mean Southerner. There's a there's an Egyptian by the uh, by the name of um, that's known by the Greek rendition of his name, and I think it's Phineas. Somebody looked that up. Phineas, P H I N E A S. Phineas. Matter of fact, let I'll do it. Let's do it. Let's do it together. I'm just trying not to spend too much time on one thing. Because we're not going to do a six-hour thing this time, y'all. I'm going to tell you that right now. Okay, but let's let's look this up. Um, Phineas. I'm just going off the top of my head, so let's see, let's see if I'm right, if I spelled it right. Not Phineas and Ferb. Um. Okay, I, I typed in Phineas and a whole lot of Phineases came up. And that's not a good thing because I'm trying to look for a particular Phineas. Well, if you all look up Phineas, um, I'm trying to find the one I'm talking about. But they say his name means Southerner. And uh, like I said, a lot of Phineas come up. King Phineas, Phineas Banning, Phineas Barnum, Phineas Bowles, Phineas. Uh, that's definitely not the Phineas I'm looking for. Yeah. Anybody else in the chat? Any Anybody familiar with that name? Anybody, anybody, anybody. All right, we'll come back to that. See, and that's crazy because I, I come across these things regularly when I'm not looking for them. Okay, but hold it, but Tony, I ho hope you understand what I'm saying. So, no Nubian. Now, um, the Remich was not a homogeneous um, group of people on a biological level, by no means. Um, and then we have. The way that they structured their society, you have 42 sapat or gnomes, and each of those gnomes 
um, had a what the Greeks would call a no mark, a person who has like a governor. Like the United States of America has 50 states, and each state has its governor. Um, the 42 gnomes can be similarly compared to that, and each gnome had a governor. And so if that's what you mean, where they had their own um, totems and, 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 and things like that, um, then those would be different. But collectively, they saw themselves as a remage. So it depends on what level of, of um, detail you're at. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, is it fair to deduce the remage burying their ancestors on the West Bank, substantiate their ancestors and theology initially came from the green Sahara of West Kemet. Um, I don't know if, if we can make that conclusion. I don't, I'm not sure we can make that, draw that conclusion because this is what we have to understand that the ancient Egyptian orientation, um, matter of fact, let me pull this up for y'all. There's be something we can go over real quick. See, I, I'll do these quick things. Um, so let's go over this. And by and by the way, this this what I'm about to show you all is is um it's available on a video in our archives. So I'm gonna go over it kind of quick with you all right here. Because um, you can watch it. Real quick, uh, just to add on what Obi Wan Kenobi uh, said, because he added um, extra on a question. He said, "Or is it just because the sun sets in the west?" All right. So, um, I'm going to answer that by 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 showing this. All right. Um, this is Egyptian orientation. This is something that that um, confused a lot of people, which which made me do a presentation on this um, a long while back so I'm, I'm just going to share this with you all very quickly um, it was actually not that many slides so I might as well just show, show this to you all because I want everybody to be thorough in this All right. so first we're talking about Egyptian orientation which was different than ours so first we define orientation orientation is defined as one's position in relation to the geographic true north to points on a compass or to a specific place or object. Today, our orientation is based on facing the direction we call north, which is reflected in how we see world maps and the depictions of the various continents. So everybody and their mother um, is used to looking at a globe, whether it's a spherical globe or a flat map, you looking at the continents like this. What this does at a very early age, it it um, programs our mind to have this world view. This is our orientation. This is programmed into us at a very early age just by us visualizing these maps and, and the, the way the continents are orientated. All right? So everybody knows that. So now, if we, if we isolate Africa right now, this would be our orientation this male figure here standing on standing on Africa is facing the north to his rear or back is the south on his right hand side is east and on his left hand side is west so this is equivalent to our um, orientation now different cultures have different orientations so cultural orientation, a reference for describing navigation and location. And it's always related to body parts in historical and ancient times. So you can tell a culture's orientation by looking at how they describe um, lo location relationships, relationships between uh, two or more locations and their body parts. OK, so, for example, in old German, the word for left was equivalent to our current north. And this indicates that the people, these old Germans um, speakers, they orientated themselves facing towards our east, which is to the rising sun. Because if their left hand 
was was um, equal to our north, then that means they were facing the east. Now, the same is true for the Lesgian people, which in their language, the word kefir means disbeliever, and it also means north or northerner. The Lesgians are Muslims, and the north of them, and to the north of them, um, was inhabited by non-Muslims whom they called disbelievers. So they called the north Khefer. In Hungarian, the word for north is Ezzak, which is derived from Ezzaka, which means night, since in the northern hemisphere, the sun never shines from the north. Okay, so you can see, you can trace out these words to tell how a group of people were orientated. Now, this is the orientation of the old German facing the east, and many cultures face the east as their orientation. Okay, that means that's their worldview. All right. Now, the indigenous peoples of Africa are of the first known to use body parts to map out geography and directions. The entire territory for a given society was laid out in relation to the human body. Whatever direction the head was found is a direction of the orientation of the people. Okay, because we know the head is the is the is the um, top portion, or that um, when we say head to toe, we it's the starting point, it's the beginning. The head usually represents the beginning of something. Now, in ancient Kemet, the head was placed to our south at the source of the Nile. The feet placed to our north at the delta. The left hand placed to our east and the right hand placed to our west. So this is how ancient Egyptians orientated themselves. Now, mind you, the cardinal points of north, south, east, and west are fixed. They're fixed points. So the ancient Egyptians would be facing the south. That's their orientation, which means if they face the south, then that means their left hand is east. Their right hand and arm or right side is the west. All right. So now what I'm going to show you is this is our vantage point. This is from our vantage point looking at the ancient Egyptian in their orientation. So the next picture I'm going to show you is that we're going to become the ancient Egyptian and look at it through their vantage point. And that's what this is right here. So now we are the ancient Egyptian and we will be facing the south. With the north being behind us, the east being on our left and the west being on our right. OK, now, how do we know this is because in the Egyptian language, we have the words. So the word Iabet is the word for east, but it's also the word for the left hand. The word resut, which is south, it means the head. It's the word for head, the beginning of something, something that is elevated. And the head is definitely elevated. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Um, upriver. Amenet or amenetit is the word for west, and it's the right side or right hand. The word mehu or mehet is the word for north, and it means something that is submerged, the end of something. The feet downriver. Okay. And so if we were to look at this orientation right here, and let's say this person lays down flat on the African map, the continent, which is this picture. So now he's laying flat. Now it it will make more sense to you because the head is in the south. Resut, south. The feet are in the north. Mehut or Mehet, north. The right hand is in the west, Amenet, and the left hand is in the east, Iabet. So you got that? So to the Egyptians, the sun rises on their left side, pans through the sky, has its zenith at their head, and then it declines and sets on their right hand side. And so to answer you, to get to the answer to your question, the West Bank was for the deceased because that's the end of the living, where the where life ends, 
like the journey of the sun where the sun's journey ends and the sun enters the um, the underworld all right and so um, a lot of the funerary temples and things like that are on the west bank of the Nile the west side which would be the right side all right um, and then as an extra bonus when you hear people say upper and lower Egypt or upper and lower Kemet it's strictly talking about elevation that's it because the um, in upper Egypt the elevation is higher you have higher altitude because as you as you travel over here is the Mediterranean and I know y'all can't see my cursor let me put my trusty arrow over here is the Mediterranean over here is the southern border of, of Egypt and so as you travel from the south coming downstream the, ri the river flows downstream with gravity and so it's coming down in elevation to the point where it's at sea level and it empties into Mediterranean Sea hence sea level so this is why it's called upper Egypt not because it's upper as in direction it's upper as in elevation not direction so when people say up north like no you're not going up north there's no such thing as up north <laughs> people try to make sense of it that way and that's not, not that's not the right way to do that you don't go up north the cardinal points are fixed you go north or you go south if you if you're traveling from the north and you're going south you're going up the river you're going upstream so if they're going to say that they should say up south And that's probably what people um, try to say, up south. You're going up south. All right. But, you know, that's, that confused people. And that's why people come to me come to me and ask me those type of questions. But, all right, so I hope y'all get that. And that's, that's it. So I'm, I don't want to um, dwell on all that uh, too long. But hopefully you all, if you, if you didn't know that, then hopefully that helped you out. For some of you all, that's just a review. You all knew that. And you're probably like, all right, with y'all, yarn, yarn, yarn. This is boring. This is boring. I learned that in sixth grade. But yeah, you might have. All right, anything else? Let's see. Um, so the answer is because the sun sets on there. Not because of the green Sahara. And I'm going to tell you how we, how we know the first part of your question is not the case. is because the Egyptians at all times, they knew that their, um, that their genesis and origin came from the south. That's why they named the south the head or the beginning. They came from the beginning. The beginnings of their culture and their and their um, movement um, to unify and that whole unification movement came from a southward direction traveling north. All right. If you go back further, further in time, uh, you're going to get into the peopling. There's a difference, and, and this is something that has to be made very clear. There's a difference between peopling a geographical territory versus what the people are known for um, and where that came from. So for example, the the human beings that populated the Nile Valley and the Delta area came from multiple directions over a stretch of period of time. But what we now know as ancient Egypt and all the things we come to know and love about Egypt its symbolisms, its writing system, its um, all the different elements of the ancient Egyptian culture, that has its genesis in the South. That has its genesis in the South. The Egyptian text says so. The archaeological record says so. The material culture that we can hold in our hands say so. Scholars have written about this. Um, and it's just getting, you know, more and more um, popular now of that notion because these things were on the hush hush early in, in, um, in early Egyptology. They ignored it. 
And when they did stumble across it, they they were in disbelief. All right, you can if in you know you can do further research on Reisner, Breasted, uh, Lepsius, and those p- people during those um, periods of time in their scholarship. All right, so let's keep it moving. Um, uh, Falain says, you said, I think dual is left out on purpose in the West. Oh, oh, when I was saying, yeah, dual. Um, the, uh, the, the dual in terms of number. Uh Materialism, he says, materialism can't fit the concept of duality. Um, well, I don't know. You have to, maybe we have to talk about that another time. All right, let's keep going. Um, Sharp Spear, I asked about that last night. Phineas, Wu, in the Bible, they say uh, Nubian or Southern. Yeah. And I think, um, let me get, pulled it up. Let me pull it up. And nope, not that. Uh, Panaisi. And I was spelling the name wrong. And of course, if you spell the na- a name wrong, you will not find it. So let me share this with y'all. On the screen. Oh, I guess unshare. Okay, let me share this. Okay, so on the screen now you see uh Panahis. It's good old Wikipedia, y'all. And mind you, listen, if you if you all take the time out um by now everybody should be comfortable with, with wikipedia i remember when wikipedia first came out you were clowned if you use wikipedia i remember on google hangouts and i remember you know years ago when wikipedia people people were using wikipedia and quoting for wikipedia you were ridiculed and and put down uh and joked and laughed um if you were to use wikipedia but since then wikipedia has been the go-to and nobody should have a problem with wikipedia because um, Wikipedia has its sources and references and citations within the article, whatever article you're, you're reading. So you always definitely go to the bottom and then pull those resources, pull the references, you know, stop at Wikipedia. But anyway, if you look at um, Panahisi, this is the person I was talking about. I said Phineas. Um, because I think that's, I believe that's the um, Greek way of pronouncing and spelling the name out. But Panahisi, and it says Panahisi was an Egyptian noble who bore the titles of chief uh, servitor of the Aten in the temple of Aten in Akhen Aten, second prophet of the Lord of the two lands. Um, and this um, name started to denote southerner that this person was from the southern and that's that's why i brought it up earlier and so nahisi, nahisi which means the southerner as they were translated pa meaning the in later egyptian and then nahisi meaning those of the south of ta nahisi which was south all right so that's all that's one reason why i wanted to um share that and show that to you all all right let's keep going how much are we looking for time? All right, we don't have much time, y'all. Uh, Panahas in the Bible. What's the what's the Bible quote? We could we could we could pull it up if we got time. If y'all want to share that. Okay, so Tony, this was in relation to the other. It's I got you because they ethnically identified as Egyptians. Nubians were still separated by cultures. Okay, yep. 
Oh, you already you already had the uh, quote in there. Exodus six twenty five, Pa Nahasi, the Negro. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's crazy because um, we know Negro means black, and like I said, that really, really, really has to be un unraveled so that we can stop falling for the banana in the pale tailpipe when it comes to um, race, the social construct of race. We really, really have to do that. All right. Some of you all are um, still drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm trying to take it away from y'all. But y'all are not letting, letting that uh, cherry Kool-Aid go, boy. Uh, I'm trying to keep going. Any other society have the same direction orientation? Uh, I'm not sure. If you If you ask me about equivalent to the ancient Egyptians uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure of the exact orientation I'm sh you know I can't I couldn't name it I should say but with all the different societies around the globe I would think that we could find some even on the continent um, that's when they started calling Nubians dark Caucasians <laughs> but see now Rasan what's interesting about that is that Caucasian you know people don't really use that term anymore but when we were when they were using the the terms called Caucasoid and Negroid Mongoloid that had a direct link to um cranial craniology cranials and and skulls and things like that and so they they demarcated certain features of skulls and lame, named them Caucasians and whatnot whatever the case is and then so you can say dark Caucasians because Caucasians is a label for a skull type pretty much um, in general not skin you see and so they say that the Egyptians were Caucasians because of the skulls and Eritreans Somalians um, you know and all that have Caucasian like skull types they're just dark Caucasians but in our head and in our mind, and um, especially here in the United States of America, when we hear the word Caucasian, we, we put an equal sign and then the word white next to it. Caucasian equals white. You see? So it it's just gets tricky. We, just, we, got, we get really, really better divorce ourselves from, from the lens of the social construct of race. But we can't be naive to think it doesn't exist, but we have to stop using it when we when we analyze things okay that's a different i want y'all to get that Di we need to divorce ourselves from the whole concept of race when we're analyzing things because it's, it's it works against us it really does um strife we have the Namir palette that shows the unification of Kemet. Do we have any other artifacts that show the Kemet southern origins? Yes, we do. Um, we did a pre we had a previous show where I showed the um, Sia, Sia Ali um, cylinder seal. And I want you to look that up. Matter of fact, let's let's look that up. Let's look it up. C. Ali. Seal. So we're going to look it up. And I have found it. And let's see. Where can I go to get a really good shot of it? Um, hmm. Ah, okay. Here we go. So I'm going to show you this paper. I got to take your message off the screen for a hot second. And I know this paper looks like it's small. Can I take away? Well, okay, the paper is called The Location of Taseti and Related Subjects by Samia Bashir Dafa'ala. All right. Um, and it's a good paper by the way and if you need it let me know um, or you can go to academia and 
um, type in that title and get it yourself. I'm not sure if you're a member of Academia, but get it. Um, but anyway, it says the earliest mention of the toponym Tassetti, and he goes on, but I'm not going to read it to you, right? You know, I'm not going to read you a bedtime story, but I want to show you this image. Let me um, blow this up. Up, oh, do I get it big? Okay, it's as big as I can get it right now. So here's the Siali seal impression, and on this impression, we see the, the name Tassetti. We see a Sarek, and these are all what became later known as Egyptian iconography or icons, symbols. We have the king enthroned on a, on, a, on, a, on a seat. We see the bull's tail or a tail. We don't know in this image if it's a bull's tail or what, but it's a tail. We have um, the falcon perched on a Sarek. The falcon over here perched on a, I'm not sure if y'all can see my cursor. The falcon perched on a Sarek. Um, and this is from CLE. Now, mind you, this, um, let me show you the date for this. Uh, let's see if we can find the date. Um, it says, with regard to the date of the CLE material, it has been given a terminal A group dating. That is um, NAG 3A, circa 3200 BC. Now, this is, in, this is found in the area of Kustul. All right, Kustul. And if you look on the map for the area of Kustul, let's, let's do that real quick. Let's go Wikipedia and look up Kustul. And if you were, oh, this map is definitely not going to help us out because it doesn't show uh, the proximity of anything near it. So let me, let me find a better um, map of Kustul. And I just saw it. Right, here we go. Okay. So, um, probably click on it. Okay, here we go. Kustul. Kustul is where? Right here. So, Balana is between, um, right next to Balana on the other side of the river of Balana. Oh, you all can't see it. I'm sorry. You all can't see what I'm seeing. Bring it back up. All right, now you should be able to see it bigger. Okay, so Kostul is on the um, east bank of the Nile River, where Balana is on the west bank. And so it's, it's between the first cataract. It's closer to the second cataract. All right, for those who don't know what a cataract is, these are obstructions in the river, waterfalls, or where the river gets very shallow and rocky. All right, and so it's near the second cataract. So this is um, where these items were found, and which tells us that these are early iconography and things. And I'm only showing you one, but there's there are others. But this one example tells you that the genesis of the Egyptian iconography, what we what we know and love of ancient Egypt, has its genesis in this area. And this area was was um, popular in antiquity because this area should be known or you should know that um, the volume of water around this area where you have the third cataract um, has a volume, a high volume of water per like square mile or square mileage because the Nile River folds back on itself. And so within a certain given geographical territory, you have access to more of the river than you do when the river just goes in a straight line. Okay. So that's just something to keep in mind. But that's to answer your question. Um, so that's um, it. Is. I've also put a link. Uh, it's actually timestamp on one of the videos. I know we did two videos. Um, so one of the videos where uh, there was a discussion on the CLE, I still, uh, it was a little bit more in depth. So I put that on the chat. Um, for wh who was it that asked the question? Strife. Uh, for Strife. Yeah, so Strife, check that out. And definitely check the archive because um, um, 
yeah, there's a lot going on there, you know, that uh, there's a lot that we've discussed. Um, if you haven't been on the channel for a while, so definitely go to the archive and, and catch up with that. All righty. So, yeah, Rasan make it a point that um, the term Caucasoid was rooted in the sort of phrenology, which is pseudoscience. Yeah. Um, race is pseudoscience. People try to use it in a scientific way or in a scientific conversation, and they do so to um, in error. And they, they force it to become pseudoscience. Race is a social construct. It's a proxy. It's, it's lookership at its best. Um, <laughs> he said, we're Adam and Eve, and they hate you, uh, Afro Ninja. It's crazy. Um, Adam and Eve were Adamites. Eve was an Eveite, a Hawaiite, Havilite, uh, Donnie. Now, mind you, we only got, um, a few more minutes, you all, so I see nobody came on the panel. It's all good. We're just having fun. We're just uh, hanging out. A question. How do they know Cataract was there at the time? Reason I ask because over time it could be possible. Over time, could it be possible it formed? Um. Well, I mean, that's a logical uh, question to ask because a cataract, what a cataract is. Matter of fact, let's pull up pictures of cataract. Let's see. Let's see if we have some pictures of the cataracts um let me pull them up real quick if you all want to look this up as well um go to cataracts of the nile on wikipedia and i'll, I'll just reshare my screen we'll just look at them together because they usually have some pictures on here we'll find out real quick Okay, there's six cataracts um, of the Nile. And in Egypt, the first cataract cuts through Aswan. It's former... Lo oh, you all can't see the... I'm talking as if you all can see it. My apologies. So, yeah, this is the article, Cataracts of the Nile, Wikipedia. Um, now, just to keep in mind, when I do... When, when we quote these things, just re this, this proves the point I was making earlier when we first started. A lot of things that we go over and go through is regurgitating things that are done. And and so we, we got to realize that that's what we're doing because, to me, this is not good enough. We need to advance the knowledge. We need to expand the knowledge, you know, because this stuff has been here. This stuff is um, it's old stuff. I mean, information-wise, it would be new to particular people. But overall, in the bigger picture, this is old. Um, but anyway, cataracts. So you see them numbered on the map over here. You see them numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. And so, I, but I'm, my reason I come here, I want to go to the pictures. Yeah, so they do have pictures here. So this is cataract. Is it big? Yeah. So this is the first cataract. Um, let's see, there's a second one. That's the second cataract. That must be an older picture. Yep, 1880, 1854. Uh, look at that cataract there. Uh, you're definitely not um, getting through that one. Now, here's, here's my question. Um, when was the Aswan Dam built? Does anybody know off the top of the head? In the chat, help a brother out. When was the Aswan Dam built? Well, um, that's a, that's a, um, I believe it was the 1970s. Anybody could tell me. Just type it in the chat. I just, I just don't want to move away from, from the images that I'm looking at. All right, but never mind. Let me, because there's, there's a delay. Let me pull it up. It says between 1960 and 76, the filling to, to completion. 
All right, appreciate it. Uh, well, the reason why I ask that is because the images that we see prior to the S1 dam being built are likely, you know, we could kind of rule out that the cataract just formed, you know, and things like that because that's before this the, the disruption of the Nile, uh, Nile River. All right. So I just want everybody to be aware of that. So this is a picture from 1854. This is the second cataract. So let's go to the next one. This is the third cataract. All right. So you see waterfalls and you see the shallowness of the water. But evidently, if you can see the greenery on the banks, when the Nile River once flooded, then obviously it left its um, its um, nutrients and silt, as they say, along those banks and everything. All right, so keep that in mind. The Nile River no longer floods, but it did. Which begs the question of certain cataracts um, weren't really obst um, obstructions during flooding time. They may not have been. So keep that in mind. Here's the fourth cataract. Fifth cataract. In the sixth, sixth cataract. All right, so those are all of them. Got a few few more minutes. Why is the S one cataract known as cataract one and not the last? Well, they're coming from um, Egypt, so it's label number one. You know, they Egyptians didn't call them that at all. So that's a modern naming convention. All right, just so you know. Um, all right, so I've, 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 I'm at the end of the list, y'all. I'm at the end of the uh, chat. Like I said, I'm not doing a six-hour thing. I'm definitely going to end, end on time, which is in a few minutes. So what, what can we... Um, Oh, Jehudi Rod Netcher, let's see. Is there some place I can look to find out who Nefertiti's mother and father was? Um, Nefertiti and not Nefertari. So first of all, you know, just, just be mindful not to confuse Nefertiti from Nefertari, because a lot of people do that. I'm not saying you are, but um, you know, but I, I'm I'm assuming you're asking me for a quick reference because I know, you know, I know that you can um start with google and start with you know wikipedia google google ship like everybody else does and then kind of make your way uh find your way through there but there are some good books on um neferet et um which is what her name is neferet et and versus the other one that people confuse with neferet iri um but we say nefertari or nefertiti and um, there's some good books. Let me see if I can pull up some some of the names of the good books. Uh, because there are some scholarly debates about her parentage. Um, trying to find. Well, um, if you look on Wikipedia, um, it was telling you that Nefertiti Nef Nef was the daughter of Ai and a woman besides Tay. But Ai's wife, first wife died before Nefertiti's rise to the position of queen. So um, you can get that um, from Wikipedia itself. And then obviously it gives you a citation. Um, and the, that would be Dodson Aiden. And that's not actually a particular book on Nefertiti herself, but a um, book on something else. But yeah, it says um, parentage is from I and a, and a different woman. And this is from Wikipedia. Yeah, and if you read the Wiki article, it, it supports what I was saying, that there's some debating about her parentage. All right, so... Um, 
you're going you're going to have a rough time with that uh Jehudi Ron Netcher. I'm just going to let you know ahead of time. Don't say I didn't tell you. All right. But um if I find um my uh, books on it and titles uh, cuz I was trying to look quickly. Um I don't have them right here to show you right now. Um Sharp Spear, uh, your question, what's that book with all the nations known to the Egyptians? Um, I'm not sure if there's a there's a particular book that has all of them, but I, I have a lot of books that have a lot of the nations, you know, the different peoples that Egyptians encountered and whatnot. And so I created a list just on just from my notes from different books, but a good book to get everybody who is listening right now, you must get. Dr. Theophilo Benga's African Philosophy. Okay, I repeat. African Philosophy by Dr. Theophilo Benga. Get that book. If you don't have it, shame on you. Um, but, you know, it'd be very good if you get that book. In that book, um, Sharp Spear, he, um, he lists a lot of the nations um, in there. I don't know if he does an exhaustive list, like names everyone. But he has a very good um, list in that book. Okay, African Philosophy by Dr. Theophilo Benga. All right, definitely get that. Um, all right, so listen, we're coming to the end now. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. And I really appreciate everybody hanging out. And, you know, we're going to keep this up. Uh, we've got different shows like this is this is our series of um, Kim and chill Q and A's you know sharing hanging and engagement but we'll, we will put on like demonstrations presentations on different topics and we look and we look for recommendations on topics uh, to present all right so um, so I want you all to you know think about some topics or, or think about some questions because we're going to do this routinely now we will pull up on you out the blue so you got to have your um your questions handy you know write them down type them up so when you when you um when you pull up on you you, you have everything ready all right so let me catch you got any last uh words um oh well not so much really just um uh dua to to everybody who participated in tonight's discussion and yeah so we'll do more of that and definitely from your what we saw yesterday uh do more readings as well because that was um, scary. <laughs> but yeah, I'll do our for, the, for, you know, having this discussion. All right, just lastly, Rasan said earlier, you said Pa Nahisi was from the priesthood of Aten, but I'm sure, oh, Pa Nahisi, yeah, Aten, but I'm sure in the Bible that they had him as the priest of Ra. Okay, yeah, we can we can uh, look more into that, but yeah, that you know in the in the wiki article, uh, Pa Nasi. Um, the point I was making, bringing the name up though, is because because it came came to connote Southerner, you know, but they you know they want to put the black thing in there, and it means black and this and that, Negro. All right, um, last one, last one. Do you agree with? real history photos of the Hyksos Kings. I'm not familiar with that off the top of my head. But I tell you what, Mark Mark White, please um subscribe to this channel cuz when we go when we go live again, you know, bring that back up. Okay? And then I we can look at it. I don't mind looking at it together. All right? So listen, it's 2 hours and I'm going to say and I appreciate everybody for tuning in and I'm sure somebody else is going to be live, probably live right now or going to go live. Make sure, you know, support, um, support each other, you know, support. If you have the time, listen out, uh, you know, don't cause any trouble. Like the brother Sean, see Sean coming up in here, uh, starting trouble already. He's like, Wujau, you're going to meet him in Detroit. See, Sean starting trouble already. It's like, nah, let me stop. <laughs> I always say that about Sean, but you know, nah, um, but yeah, support, you know, whoever's going to be going live because we, we usually tag team on these topics between myself, Osara Motep's channel, um, the brother Sanjeti, 
uh, don't think that he's like um, MIA. Sanjetti is, uh, matter of fact, the brother Sanjetti recently did a presentation on Facebook, I believe on the Shrine of My Ots Facebook channel, Facebook um, page. Go check it out. He did a really good job on ritual, ancient Egyptian ritual or African ritual. I forget the exact title, but it was good. So definitely check it out. Look for the brother Sanjetti Ankara. All right. Um, brother Smash Rockwell. Uh, he he uh, usually does something in the morning his time. Because remember, Smash is on the on, in California. He's on the West Coast. So my 12 o'clock is his 9 in the morning. And so he'll he'll have like a morning show for him. But for me or those of us on the East Coast, it's 12 noon. And so sometimes I could catch him and sometimes I can't. So definitely check out his uh, channel. Check out all the channels, Mostly Warrior. Um, and you're going to find something that, that, you, that you're into between the channels. You got the Pseudo Killers, the Real Black Atheists, Mostly Warrior, um, Asar Motep, uh, Dagger Squad. Now, I think, I think he renamed it to Brother Garfield Podcast. Um, yeah, just check everything out. Check everything out. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, though. People start tripping, man. You know, you got to make sure you keep your sanity. Don't lose your brain cells. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say peace to everybody. Um, and I really appreciate, um, if I get this, let me move this message here. Yeah, we appreciate everybody tuning in. So I'll see you all next time. Hotel. You said that when you go to chemistry school, you became more alert. You, you made a work up, your spirit work up. And you became a more human being. That's your character is built in a school. Classical studies. Uh, you may, we must know Medu nature. You see, maybe in the future we need to know some meritic too. We need to know Medu nature. For me, it's education. The way they think, they build, and they practice their education is very unique in history. Without education, I believe there will be no commitment.